distinguished uh, friends on the dais and the intellectual and academic elite of uh, Kochi and Ennaka. It's indeed a special honor to be asked to deliver the sixth quarterly lecture of the Center for Public uh, Policy Research. Uh, when I heard the names of the people who have delivered it earlier to me, uh, it, it was a very, very humbling experience. In fact, Dhanaraj, if I had known that these people had delivered it before me, if I had known it before you asked me to deliver this lecture, I may have found some excuse not to deliver the lecture. Because uh, the, 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 the standards that you have set and the, the goalposts that you have uh, laid down is uh, something really commendable. And I do hope uh, uh, we can at least come, I can at least come somewhere to the hem of the people who have already invited for this. Uh, friends, I'm looking at today more as a opportunity for a dialogue. Uh, I have been to Kerala many times. I have been to Kochi and Ernakulam on several occasions. And I must say, each time I have gone back to Bangalore, I have gone back a wiser person. Though of course my 21 year old son tells me I can never be wiser than what I have been. Uh, but I also hope that today, as I move out of this hall after listening to what friends would have said, uh, I would have a much better uh, understanding and appreciation of what constitutes the multiple strands of Indian democracy and the political process. Uh, the title is there before you, the emerging electoral landscape in the country and then using that emerging electoral landscape to try and uh, analyze uh, what constitutes uh, democracy in this country. Uh, to start with, I would say, uh, I'd like to use the window of the election which is coming up uh, to try and understand issues of democracy, politics and elections. Uh, uh, I would underline the fact that I would not want to focus on 2014 elections alone. Uh, 2014 elections is a moment in the unfolding of our democracy and politics and our elections. So I'd like to use 2014 elections as that peg on which I hang my analysis of party, politics, democracy and elections. Uh, and having said that, I'd like to raise the question that um, is the 2014 elections in any way setting a new trend? Uh, Dharaj asked this question in the beginning. Uh, because we are so close to the election, we always think that every election is a trendsetter. We always think every election is going to bring about some dramatic change because we are close to that election. Uh, so let's see how, uh, let's try and analyze whether uh, 2014 is in significant ways different from what was in the past and in what ways can it be different. Uh, I'll just raise two points to begin with. If you ask me, 2014, the nature and structure of the contest is very different. And that's what makes 2014 special and that's what makes the events which are part of 2014 election important for Indian democracy and Indian politics. Uh, a point which uh, Gopakumarji mentioned in the passing, have these states become the new center of politics? And I'm not just referring to the point which Gopakumarji made, which is state-based parties becoming important. I'm also raising the question, are the so-called national parties, the Congress, the BJP, the CPM, the CPI, the BSP, are all these parties also some way becoming state-based parties? The only difference being they are multiple state-based parties. 
They are also state-based parties, but becoming state-based parties in multiple states. So, and which again sustains the thesis I'm talking about that states are emerging as the center of politics. And I, and it, uh, I was uh, Gopumar Ji and I and Mr. Abraham were just now hearing Mr. Rahul Gandhi making a very very strong speech in UP. And one of the points he was making in his speech just as we were coming down was he was saying to people that we will take decisions if you vote us to power not in Delhi but in all our state capitals. So I don't know if he saw our presentation before he made that speech. <laughs> Earlier in the morning, speaking again somewhere in UP, Mr. Modi talked about the good things, thankfully, not only what Gujarat has done, but also what Madhya Pradesh has done, what Chhattisgarh has done. He definitely has not seen our PowerPoint presentation before his The issue I'm raising is the political class today is talking of the states. If you see Mr. Karat's presentation on where he thinks the election is heading towards, he also spoke about certain states being important. There was a whole program on Mamta Banerjee today asking the question that will she be leading a party which could well be the third largest party in the coming Lok Sabha. Now, for me, all these are pointers of a trend. In 2004 elections, soon after the NDA lost, sometime in December 2004, when speaking before the national executive of the BJP, Mr. Vajpayee asked a very rhetorical question. He said, those who lost the election do not know why they lost the election. Those who won the election do not know how they won the election. For him it was a puzzle, even after five months of the result. Now possibly if Mr. Vajpayee had looked at it from this angle, states at the center of Indian politics. Because 2004 started that trend, significantly. Because every state of India in 2004, or let me put it differently, every neighboring state came up with different results. What are the specificities in a particular We are now becoming a presidential democracy, presidential democracy, because you are talking of Rahul versus Modi, etc., etc. Now, Suhas alerted me and others to this point that it's not a presidential democracy. Are we moving to a plebiscitary style of leaders of mainstream parties, uh, including speeches like uh, speeches which Mr. Kejriwal makes? Now, elections seem to be like a statement of conclusion on the agendas which are proposed by these leaders, if not in the term of a manifesto document, but at least in terms of how these leaders portray what they believe. Two more points, and this I think is an important question I'd like to ask. In the studies that both Ji and I have done in the past, we have found one very, very consistent pattern. And a consistent Western democracies where Western writers consistently say that younger people vote and think differently. But is 2014 going to see a difference? I suspect it is going to see a difference. I suspect that 2014 will see a generation gap in attitudes. Good or bad, that's not for me to say. What are the indicators of this generation gap? I'll just give you two or three indicators. And I'll also, also make this point that maybe this generation gap is now becoming visible because this is becoming a substantial chunk of the whole voting population. The less than 25 age group is emerging as an important block of voters across the country. If you look at the success of the Ahmadmi party in Delhi, in the Delhi assembly elections, very clearly 
the support that the Amadmi party drew in Delhi was very much from younger voters. If you had a choice, who would you like as the Prime Minister of India? And we don't offer any names. Across the country, our tracker polls in January and February showed across the country. On an average, around 32% people took Mr. Modi's. Of course, it was significantly lower in South India. You ask those younger than 25. If you, in that same question, if you look at the younger than 25, what is their snack? I don't know whether to say surprisingly or not surprisingly. 51%. That 32 shoots up to 51%. It's not a surprise that in North India and West India, young people are at the base of the mobilization that the BJP has been able to achieve. Why are you? What's the attraction? And I try to put it neutrally. Haven't you heard of Godra? I tell both so that nobody blames me of being partial. Godra, I mean, uh, anti-Sikh riots happened before we were born. And when Godra happened, we were 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. my baggage of my past to carry. And I worry, I was worried, how do these people don't have that baggage? And why are they not worried about that baggage? I broke deeper. And I, I, I'm going to share two points and leave it to you to decide where the truth lies, maybe in between the two sons. A lot of young people are attracted to what's happening today, largely because of their frustration with what they see on the other side. People have also moved, and I'm not just, just I'm not just talking about educated, urban, upper class, upper caste youths. I'm taking, I'm talking across the spectrum. A lot of youths say, our future, our world. Our employment, the world we are going to live in, that's what's important for us. And therefore you are, uh, uh, what we often say, this whole talk about caste and other identities. It's not that this, it's not important for young people, but then the package of what is important includes other variables also today. It's what I often call caste plus. And those pluses are equally important today. I'll come back as part of the discussion to what does the our phenomenon imply and mean. Three categorically visible trends today, which I think will define and decide the shape of Indian democracy and politics in the days to come. And I'll spend a minute on each of these trends. I think nobody can Ignore the fact that the 2014 elections is being fought in an environment where the government in Delhi seems to be on the back foot. Of course, a Congress supporter told me, and we also like cricket a lot, he says most Indian players play very well on the back foot. So I leave that point there. That uh, even though you say Congress is on the back foot, back foot players are also century scorers. Okay. Uh, the second point, and I think the entire line is important, consolidation by the BJP in its strongholds. And I'll come back to that point. And thirdly, this emerging non-Congress, non-BJP alliance, uh, Gopakwarji is uh, rightly put it, third front if you may, federal front if you may. Which brings me to the point that are we seeing somewhere a northwestern monsoon which is taking us in one direction and a southeastern drought which is taking us in another direction. 
and the monsoon and drought is keeping in mind the BJP and MP. Is that somewhere happening? And does that in some way uh, define the variety that 2014 will have for us? Now friends, I'm going to, now this is one critical trend and then I'm going to show you a very unique map of India. If you look at what the tracker poll showed till February this year, a rise in the vote share of the NDA and the collapse in the vote share of the UPA and the others. And as you will notice there, the vote share of the UPA uh, falls by 4%. Uh, that of the others falls by a certain percentage there. And the gainer, the net gainer of this is the India. Let me try and explain this in a different way. This map is how the electoral scene looked in February. And I'll point out to where it may be different in March. Uh, I think, uh, I hope my color choice is right. My wife often tells me I'm colorblind. Uh, the orange here marks the area where the BJP and NDA seem to have an upper hand clearly seem to have an upper hand. Many of these states are states ruled today by the BJP and they seem to be capitalizing on their presence of their state governments here. Uh, a few states where the BJP is not in power but seems to be doing well, the state of Himachal Pradesh, the state of Uttaranchal, the state of Maharashtra, and the state of Jharkhand. Uh, Jharkhand, the anger against the alliance of today, the Congress JMM alliance, the opportunism in the alliance, and the hopelessness of its performance seems to be agitating people in Jharkhand very strongly. Uh, in Maharashtra, and I'm coming from there, I was there yesterday, in Maharashtra, there is no wave in favor of anybody. Last time, the Congress NCP was five seats above the Shiv Sena BJP. What we think will happen this time is just a reversal of that position. No sweep for the BJP Shiv Sena, but just again a five seat difference. Not five point, but five seat difference. There are 48 seats in Maharashtra. A five seat difference between the two. So no sweep for them. The blue states are those which are in February. I'm qualifying that because I know I'm talking of the soil I'm standing on. Uh, in February where the Congress seemed to have an advantage. Congress and its allies, the Jammu and Kashmir, Assam, Karnataka, and Karnataka is not so big. I have included Telangana also because the Congress had an advantage there in February and of course the state of Kerala. Now, this entire region has the potential to change colors and I don't mean that in any negative sense. Uh, if, uh, as all of you follow Kerala closely, I would love to hear from you uh, how you look at the flow of the 10 seats in your state. Uh, what people have been telling me that uh, it's becoming a very, very close fight and it could be an equal sharing of spoils is what I have been hearing. Karnataka, till, a, till 10 days ago we were saying the Congress honeymoon continues because their state government had come less than a year ago and in India we have found Within a year of a state government being elected, if you have a Lok Sabha election, people generally vote for that state government or not. Karnataka seems a difference. So, uh, last 15 days, there seems to be some difference. Not that the Congress will be wiped out. I don't go with the NDTV analysis which says BJP will get 20 out of 28 in Karnataka. No, I don't think so. I think it will be more, uh, again, an equal divide between the two. Telangana. Our study which was done in February was 
people had assumed there would be a TRS Congress alliance. And in that context, people had said, for Lok Sabha Congress, for Vidhan Sabha TRS. Now with no alliance, that could also change. That could also change colors. Now what is this green? I think it's obvious. Green is where neither the NDA nor the UPA is doing well. You have state-based parties. We are talking about Tamil Nadu, we are talking of Simandra, we are talking about Odisha, we are talking about West Bengal. And the violet or purple is what I call the game changer states of this election. If anybody is going to decide who is going to be close to 272, it is UPNB. Remember, and of course, I also put Haryana in that color because Haryana doesn't seem to be very clear. But the game changer states would be UPPR. Because 120 seats, one fifth of the Lok Sabha, more than one fifth, in fact, 23 percent of the Lok Sabha. How this pans out, I think, is going to make a lot of difference. And I'll come back to this a little later. I told you that uh, the UPA government in Delhi seems to be on the back foot. Let me share a finding. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Gopakumar Ji would agree with me on this. In India, people generally have a high level of tolerance. If you ask people, how is your government doing? And I don't think, uh, maybe Kerala does not fit in that model. If you ask people, how do you think your government is doing? Even if they feel it is not doing well, they'll say, okay. It's okay. You see, it requires a really, really bad performance to say it's doing. No, it's not doing well. So in fact, in our election studies, we have been saying, if 30% say not doing well, the alarm bell should start ringing for the ruling party. But you know what this shows? 52% across the country say we are not satisfied. Which is huge. We have combined here very dissatisfied and dissatisfied. And if you do your math, it comes to 52. The saving grace for Mr. Manmohan Singh is that there is little less dissatisfaction with him than his government. But the numbers are not significantly different. What is causing this dissatisfaction? Ah, this is another question. Should UPA get a second chance? All India, you see, 52% said no. And the only region where there seems to be a tolerance towards the UPA seems to be the area that we are all part of, something new. Where only, not only, 46 percent, which is not small, said don't give it a second chance. But if you look at North India, 60 percent. If you look at Central India, 53 percent. If you look at West India, so that's why I said a northwest one monsoon and a southeast drop. That's the reason I think. Last, uh, the image of the UPA. Do you think the UPA was very corrupt? Corrupt? Not at all corrupt? Don't know. And again, if you do your math, quite a huge chunk say corrupt or very corrupt. Now, people will not make that fine-tuning distinction which Congress leaders try to make, which is, we were not corrupt, the Allies were corrupt. People say, all of you are one. Common citizen, it may be Raja or it may be Rani or whoever, but for the people, the government as a whole is what they would like to do. And therefore, the image of corruption is something visibly there. Why are you dissatisfied with the government? Uh, no proof of performance, 
price rise and corruption. Those are the three biggest chunks. Correct me if I am wrong, I think non-performance and price rise for me is also symbols of corruption. Corruption is not just about taking money and giving money. Corruption is also about having taken a mandate and not performed. For me that is political corruption in some senses. Not being able to allow people to get their daily needs at a fair price is also some way a form of corruption because you have deviated from the expectations of the people. So my first point I think very clear and this uh, if you look at the body language of Congress leaders I think the signs are very visible that they seem to be ready to sit in the opposition. If you see when the manifesto was released on Wednesday, on Wednesday they released their manifesto. Two ministers were sleeping. <laughs> Somebody told me they were not sleeping, they were worried about what will happen in their constituencies. <laughs> One minister was already in the hospital because he had decided not to contest. Many in the government are not fighting this election. Today Rahul Gandhi said, Jab hamari sarkar aegi. That means, what, what does that mean? <laughs> he said this today, Jab hamari sarkar aegi. Which, which translates itself to mean, when our government will come. <laughs> I must clarify, he was not asking it as a question. He was making it as a point. He was elaborating after that, uh, something else. The second point. Now, again, look at the levels of dissatisfaction. Now, remember, 2009, the Congress did well because it did well in urban areas across the country. Urban areas and small towns and cities, Congress did exceptionally well. But you see the high level of dissatisfaction in metros and towns. Here also it is negative. The negative means, let me explain what this is. How many people are satisfied and how many are dissatisfied, we subtract that. And minus 29 means 29% are more dissatisfied than satisfied. That's the meaning. That uh, among these, uh, if you subtract the satisfaction and dissatisfaction, this is the percentages that come. And everywhere it's minus. Please notice that. Everywhere. In all groups, it is minus. So I think, I, I don't think there is a need to slog on this point anymore. That there seems to be clearly this dissatisfaction with the government. Uh, in 2009, Manrega may have worked for them, but the food security bill came too late. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what you pass, but at the end of the day, it's about what you deliver to the people at the ground. And that, I think, is a clear fact. Let me come to my second point. In that whole orange belt which I showed in that map of India, why is it that the NDA is doing so well? A lot of it has to do with the positive image of the state governments. Uh, be it Madhya Pradesh, be it Rajasthan, be it Chhattisgarh, be it Gujarat. The fact that the state governments were doing well. Now, Modi supporters may not like this point, but I think if the BJP is getting traction in those parts, it has much more to do with the people's perception of the performance of its governments. In Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, we asked a direct question. Who was responsible for winning the state assembly elections? And most people said, and we gave them the choice. In Madhya Pradesh, we asked Chauhan or Modi. In Chhattisgarh, we asked Ramad Singh or Modi. And in both the cases, the chief minister was rated much higher in terms of being responsible for the So, I'm just trying to make the point that the BJP prime ministerial candidate was able to build on a foundation already laid. He was able to build upon a base already laid. 
and our study also shows there is not much difference between support for the BJP and support for Modi in those states. It's not that support for Modi is dramatically higher than support for the party. It is more or less on a even key. Again here, impact among young voters. If you see support for the uh, for the party, you will see significantly how it is much higher. Now, uh, I must make a point here. It's not percentage of support. It is um, percentage of difference from the average. Uh, in the case of young voters, it is 15 percentage points higher than the average, the support that the BJP enjoys. So again, is there a generation gap here? Now this is an interesting point we asked in our last study. Uh, what do you think are the positive qualities of Modi and Rao? Now, those who supported Modi and those who supported Rahul, why do you support them? If you look at Rahul, there are only two factors, three factors. He is young, 70% say that. 8% say the family. And 10% say, 10% uh, say he's honest. There are three bars. But if you look at those who say, why do we support Modi? There is a much larger set of reasons which people offer. Now this is with regard to those who are supporting the two prime ministerial candidates. And this is another interesting point. On what basis do you vote for a party? Is it party, local candidate or prime ministerial candidate? And look at the BJP supporters. The supporters of the BJP, 16%, 28%. The fact of the Prime Ministerial candidate as a factor makes a difference. What would be the role of the third, third front, federal front in this election? I think that all the groups which are part of the third and federal front are very clearly keeping their options open. I think all of them must be praying that either UP or NDA stop at 200. So that then they become key players in the game. Most of them are looking at post-election alliances, not pre-election alliances. But then internal contradictions. A leading CPI leader told me, our philosophy is, divided we stand, united we fall. <laughs> By which he meant, can you think of DMC and CPM together? Can you think of Anna DMK and DMK forget together in the same room together? Can you think of YSR Congress and TDP together? Can you think of the biggest SP, BSP together? No. So there are huge internal contradictions that are there between these two. And let's remember, for these, all these parties, they are not so much interested if NDA, UPA goes about 200, they are more interested in what's happening in their states. For them, primacy is state politics. Why is Shiv Sena making a noise today with the BJP on MNS? It has nothing to do with Lok Sabha elections. They are worried what will happen in December when the assembly elections comes. That's the concern. That's the issue that they are facing. Uh, let me come to the last point. AAP as a factor. Is it that you have an AAP candidate here? Yes. Unless the journalist. A study found two, three things about AAP. One, Tremendous goodwill. Tremendous goodwill. Good people. Not corrupt. Is Kejriwal doing a drama or is he serious? No, he's serious. Some would say drama and serious. But very few people say, very few say only drama. So there is goodwill for the, uh, there is goodwill for the experiment. There is goodwill for this experiment where you are talking of a where you are talking of a challenge to the mainstream. 
Of course, if you are a BJP Congress supporter, you will say, where are they challenged to mainstream? They are today mainstream. They are no longer a challenge to the mainstream, but after Delhi, they are mainstream also. So, goodwill for the party, goodwill has not translated itself into votes, and goodwill has not translated itself to reach a threshold of votes which will ensure victory. All over India, except four states, vote share is less than 3%. 1%, 1.5%, 2%, 3%, 4 But in four states, double digits. One is of course Delhi. And Delhi voter is very clear. For Lok Sabha elections, BJP. For Vidhan Sabha elections, Aapri. Though after Rail Bhavan agitation and resignation, some like you and me, educated, middle class have got disillusioned with me. And I, I hope I can go out of this room. Uh, I think the middle class problem is they have two standards, one for themselves and one what others should do. So when it came to the AAP, that is, oh, this is not good politics you are doing. Going on demonstration like that, sitting in dharma like that. You see middle class values in the home, in the family, exactly the same. What my friend who is now part of the AAP kept saying, middle class says, I love democracy, I hate politics. <laughs> democracy is a great thing, this politics is a horrible thing. I don't want to dirty my hands with this politics. So middle class has moved away to a certain extent, but the underprivileged socially and economically have actually increase their support. Because the ARP did something in Delhi which they wanted to do but nobody did till then. Which is fight against the police. Those of us who have had a chance to be in Delhi and talk to people in Delhi, the police is among the most hated institutions. Simply because of the injustice people feel it does to So you have a Sheila Dixit when Nirbhaya happened says, police is not under my control. And here is Kejriwal leading Rail Bhavan agitation on police. Police was the issue, as you remember. So a lot of support came because of that. So Delhi, yes, they continue to be important. And neighboring states, Haryana. It will be interesting to see what our tracker poll says next week. But last time, Haryana is interesting. Opposition is, I mean, government is discredited. Opposition leader is in jail. Now what do you <laughs> So you have to have the ideal opportunity for AAP to come in and occupy that space. Punjab, uh, the Manpreet Singh Badal supporters now don't know where to go. So AAP has come in. And Western UP, bordering Delhi, uh, last tracker poll showed something like 12 to 14 percent support. So these are the areas where the AAP stands a chance. But I would believe what their leaders have been saying, we are here for the long haul. We are not worried about the next election. We are there for the long haul. I wish the AAP had changed its strategy a bit. Now they are headline seekers. Why contest in Varanasi? Then you will be in the paper every day. Rather than that, if the AAP had said, we are not coming to power. We are going to be your watchdog against whoever comes to power. We will be there to fight out, fight out corruption. The support would have been tremendously high. And they have done one more thing, and that's again the space to occupy in the media. They have attacked the BJP, which the Congress should have been doing, but it is not done. Did any Congress leader go to Gujarat in the last two years? Why? You know, here is this chap who goes and challenges the authority. I want to see what is the development. What prevented Congress leaders from doing this in the state? So in a sense, 
aap has stolen the political clothes of the congress and is today the main challenger in some ways some would say to the bjp a role which congress should have performed they are this performed now some would say congress is not performing that role because they are already ready to sit there by way of analogies so i think it's an important phenomenon and those who write it off i think are writing a obituary too soon it's like you see mr kushwan singh who died at 99 he used to jokingly say for the last 20 years my obituary was kept ready by journalists that tomorrow it may happen tomorrow it may happen but poor people they had to wait they had to wait years with yet said before he died long before he died so those who write the political obituary of the aap would be doing it too early because i think i think there is space for such a party in politics that idealism is necessary and as somebody said uh, if aap does not do well some other form will come like aap because that type of approach is very necessary and very critical now let me come to the end of what i wanted to say my first question has the nda peaked too soon many people would say yes at least in the states they were in power they seem to have reached the maximum in january itself and then there was no more to reach the maximum had already been reached again here i would make the point i think bihar and up are the battleground states our projections last time was that in these two states the bjp could get close to 65 seats 65 out of 150 and last time we had projected that the bjp could be 195 to 205 if the 65 comes back down comes down to 30 195 comes down to 160 and you are back to your old position 1998 1999 so here is the difference the rest seems to be stitched up by them their own state now that is stitched up clear but here are the two states which can either go down or it could go up either they are of course hoping it will go up but then not to sure but here are two states which could change the entire equation those of you who are fond of cricket would under would appreciate this analogy somebody said there is a sachin tendulkar syndrome and gavaskar syndrome in this election what is that they say sachin tendulkar got out in the 90s very often in his career many times in his career he got out between 93 and 99 some people are asking the question will the same thing happen to the congress party will it fail to reach triple digit because you know there is a psychological advantage in crossing that you can say i did fall below it that's the sachin syndrome the gavaskar syndrome is in his career gavaskar and the older people here will remember that Gavaskar got out many times in his career in the 190s. Failed to score a double century. People say BJP is suffering from that syndrome. Is it going to get stuck there? Because if it gets stuck in the 180s and 190s, to reach 272, you need 90 more, and then one third of your coalition will be non-BJP. one third of the coalition will be non-BJP and then of course lot of questions will come up about who should be the prime minister of the coalition because one third is from outside and if that one third has to come they will have their terms to come you are already seeing how candidate choice is becoming a challenge what is happening in up what is happening in bihar what's happening in kerala or what's happening in karnataka i'd like to hear from you 
the strategy of the LDF to field so many independent candidates or back so many independent candidates. Because candidate choice is critical at the end of the day. And as the as the rural editor of the Hindu put it, Mr. Sainath put it, when a party crosses 220, it becomes a king. <laughs> Any party, if it crosses 220, then it is a king. Which brings me to my last, sorry, which brings me to my last point. How close is any front to 272? And I'll end with that. 